now that we've gotten that minor interesting but sort of ancillary detail out of the way about choosing between unequal or equal variances, because you know the rule now, go with unequal variances t-test all the time for purposes of this course. Let's look at two more examples of the unpaired t-test. This is an interesting one. This is a random sample of 500 carotid endarterectomy. From now on, I'm going to call it CE. Procedures performed in the state of Maryland from 1995. So I took a random draw from a database that actually had the costs for all such procedures performed in Maryland in 1995. And this compares the mean charges for this procedure for males versus females in the sample. So males on average paid $6,600 US dollars and females paid nearly $7,100 on average. And the standard deviations are given in US dollars. And there are about 270 males in this sample and about 230 females. And we might want to ask, is there evidence of a difference in the average cost for CE procedures between males and females in Maryland in 1995? So we only have sample data and we want to take what we have and extrapolate to the population of all males and females who had the procedure performed in 1995. We actually have the luxury of individual level data here. In the other two examples, I was pulling summary data from published articles and didn't have the luxury of looking at the individual data. So something we can do, I have the data, and if you want to play with it, it's posted on the lecture site. But we can actually look at visual evidence before we even get into this inferential world. Here's a box plot of the charges for males versus females. What do you notice about that picture? What do you see visually? I don't want my opinion to guide you, but when I look at this, I see pretty strong visual evidence of similar distributions. The medians are similar, the middle 50%, while slightly wider in females, is of similar order magnitude of the, that males. The outliers start at similar places, etc. Maybe there's a little more spread in females, but Visually speaking, these are looking relatively similar. But of course, what we see is not always what we get, so we also want to incorporate uncertainty into the story. So here are the confidence intervals for these average costs in the two sex groups. And I won't talk you through the math, but it's all here. One thing you will notice is that there's a fair amount of overlap in these confidence intervals. If we actually went and did the two-sample t-test, with the one assuming unequal standard deviations, i.e. unequal variances, here's what we get. If you look down to the row entitled diff, you see that the observed difference here is that females on average had charges of $473 higher than males, but the 95% confidence interval for the difference in this average females to males is negative 339 to 1,285, so it includes negative and positive values. So it does not rule out, zero is in our confidence interval, so we have not ruled out no difference at the population level as a possibility. And to go along with that, our p-value for this t-test is 0.25. At the standard rejection level of 5%, we fail to reject the null that the underlying mean charges are the same. So if I were to write this up, I might say, in a study conducted to assess determinants of CE procedure costs in Maryland, a random sample of 500 CE patients from 1995 was analyzed. The sample consisted of 229 females with average costs of $7,088, and I put the confidence intervals in parentheses here, and 271 males with average costs $6,615. Again, a confidence interval for that group. While the females in the sample had average costs of $473 greater than males in the samples, the dis difference in average cost is not statistically significant, p equals 0.25. The 95% confidence interval for the female to male average cost differential is negative 339 to 1,285. So notice, even though this result was st not statistically significant, there's still information here. And I like this write-up because it lays it all out. Frequently what will happen is somebody will tell you, well, the difference wasn't statistically significant. And as we talked about in Lecture 4, that's really only a small piece of the story. And so laying out what actually happened in your sample and the observed difference, etc., as well as a confidence interval for the true average difference, adds information above and beyond that non-statistically significant piece. 
Here's another interesting data set. The following data is taken from a 1990 study comparing random samples of adolescents with bulimia to adolescents without bulimia. Both groups had similar body composition and levels of physical activity. And this following table shows the summary data on the daily calorie intake by the bulimia status of the persons in this study. You can see that measuring kilocalories per kilogram, on average, those with bulimia in the sample ingested 22.1 kilocalories per kilogram compared to 29.7 in the group that did not have bulimia. And there's the standard deviations given as well. And here's the abstract from the article. And here's the highlighted part, which actually is where I pulled the data from. It gives the mean and standard deviation for each group. And again, I was actually able to access the individual level data through the textbook by Pagano, and it's also displayed in the article nicely, which is a rarity, but with small samples can be done. And here's box plot of the daily caloric intake by the subject's bulimia status. And here, compare this comparison. How's that? Compare this comparison to what we saw in the CE costs box plots. Here, even though the sample sizes are small and there's a lot of uncertainty, at least this is somewhat visually striking, I think. And we can see in this box plot that those without bulimia, their daily caloric intake shifts higher relative to those with bulimia, not just the center, but the whole distribution. But of course, there's not a lot of data fueling this. So we want to account for the uncertainty. So let's do... Um, confidence intervals for the average daily calorie intake for each of the two groups. And you can see what I did here. Those in the bulimic group, you know, extrapolating the confidence interval, of all the population of bulimia patients from which the sample was taken. So now this average intake could be anywhere from 20.1 kilocalories to 24.1 kilocalories per kilogram. Compare that with the non-bulimia group, and that confidence interval is 26.1 to 33.3 kilocalories per kilogram. And notice these confidence intervals do not overlap. If we do the two-sample t-test, you can see that the mean difference in average kilocalories per kilogram ingested by those in the bulimia group compared to the other group is negative 7.6 kilocalories per kilogram. And the confidence interval for this is negative 11.6 to negative 3.6 kilocalories per kilogram. So after counting for sampling variability, all possibilities for this mean difference show lower average ingestion of those in the bulimic population and if we look at the p-value for this based on the t-test, it's 0 0.0007, certainly less than the general cutoff of 0 0.05 for statistical significance. And here's how they actually presented this result in the article. And I like this presentation with one caveat. It's not very common these days for authors to display individual level data. And certainly if you have a large study, it's hard to do. But they did a nice job here. This is sort of the analysis. Uh, see if you can map this picture to the box plot we did. It's, it's a slightly different presentation. But what they have there are actually all the points for all subjects in each of the groups in terms of their kilocalories per kilogram ingested on a daily basis. And it, it's sort of a more specific box plot. The only thing I don't like about this picture are those bar part graphs, which actually go up to the median of both groups. And the thing that they're sort of visually deceiving because they both go down to zero just to fill out the area on the graph. And really the only relevant piece of information for that picture is the top of the bar. But otherwise, I think this is a really nice visual presentation, analogous to the box plots we looked at before. And then in the caption here, they say normal weight bulimic patients had significantly lower caloric intake per kilogram of body weight than age and sex max volunteers. So they found in their study design, they had found a control group of people without bulimia who were similar, otherwise similar to the bulimic patients from the sample of the population of bulimic patients. Then they said this was highly significant. That's a phrase you won't catch me using because in my opinion, you're either statistically significant or not. You're above or below the cutoff, but they then go on and report a p-value of less than 0.001. So this is sort of an atraditional but nice presentation. The only thing I'd like to see, perhaps, is a confidence interval for the difference, mean difference in weight changes, so we could get some sense of, after factoring in the uncertainty, how precise that estimate was.